The Peculiar Institution, Chapter 11. It's called the Peculiar Institution, and of course you know we're referring to the status of slavery, because it's strange, it's unusual, it's, it's not the norm in any way you look at it. But by 1820, slavery was an old institution in America. And with abolition in the northern states, that peculiar institution of slavery became unique to the South. And by 1860, in the Civil War, the slave population had increased to nearly 4 million, and slavery had spread to Arkansas, Louisiana, and even eastern Texas. Slaves were one-third of the South's entire population, and half of the population in the cotton states of the Deep South. Slavery's expansion was due to the growth of cotton production, which was replacing sugar as the world's major slave crop. Although slavery persisted in Brazil and the Caribbean, uh, Britain had abolished slavery in 1833, which makes the United States slavery the center in the Western Hemisphere. The Old South was the largest and most powerful slave society in history, primarily based on the region's virtual monopoly of cotton. Cotton's use in textile manufacturing made it central to the Industrial Revolution both in Europe and America and the most important commodity in international trade. By 1803, cotton was America's most important export. And by 1860, investments in slaves exceeded in value the worth of all the nations, factories, railroads, and banks combined. You just have a picture here of people picking cotton. I don't know if any of you all there were picking the cotton. I tried it one time just to see what it was like, and oh my gosh, I had bloody fingers. But to replace the foreign slave trade that had been banned in the United States in 1808, a massive internal slave trade developed. More than 2 million slaves were sold between 1820 and 1860, and many of whom were transported to the Deep South to the new cotton plantations. They were sold down the river. They'd be sold on that Mississippi River, and down they'd go. The cotton kingdom would not have developed without the internal slave trade, and the older slave states in the East came to depend on the sale of their slaves. As a matter of fact, Kentucky and Virginia became very big slave-selling states. Slave population in 1860. Uh, the dark areas, you can see, um, I'm not proud to say, but South Carolina and Virginia are the heaviest ones. And you'll notice that in Louisiana, uh, we don't have all that many slaves in New Orleans, but it, up the Mississippi River, you can see where there is slavery. Uh, there's more slavery in Kentucky in 1860, I think, than shown on this map. One dot represents 200 slaves. The growth of the slave population uh, from 1790, 697,000, and by 1816, almost 4 million men, women, and children in servitude. Now, although the northern states had abolished slavery, slavery did affect them. The Constitution was giving disproportionate power to the Southern states in both the House of Representatives and the Electoral College. And of course, it required all states to return any fugitive slaves. You could say slavery touched the lives of all Americans. Northern merchants and manufacturers participated in the slave economy and profited from it. Cotton trade profits helped finance the industrial development and internal improvements in the North. Northern ships carried the cotton. Northern banks financed the plantations. Northern companies insured slave property. Yeah, property, slavery was considered property, and you want to insure your property. And northern factories turned cotton into clothing, which was shipped back to the South. While slavery defined and dominated the South's economy, the South was a diverse region. In the Upper South, now we got to realize we got the Upper South and the Deep South, right? The Upper South, I usually consider uh, Virginia, Kentucky, uh, Arkansas, Delaware, Maryland. In the Upper South, slaves and slave owners were a much smaller percentage of the population compared to the Deep South. And of course, the Deep South stretched from South Carolina all the way west to Texas. The Upper South, like Nashville, Tennessee, and Louisville, Kentucky, uh, they actually had some manufacturing centers. But the Deep South depending entirely on the one crop cotton. And slavery caused the South to have a very different economic development than the North. 
If slavery inhibited the industrial growth, I mean, why would you buy a machine to do something when you've got a slave out there you own? It discouraged immigration because why would somebody come from another country they didn't like and go down south and have to compete with free slave labor? It didn't make any sense. So most of your immigrants went to the north. It slowed technological process. You didn't need it because, I mean, progress because you didn't need it because I can get, say you've got, if one slave can't do it, you've got another slave over there that can help him. And we didn't have the large and diverse cities like they did in the North, except for New Orleans and Charleston. Banks and railroad lines served the plantations, but little else. And while many of the North thought slavery prevented economic growth, slavery, in fact, was a very profitable, very profitable business, and it was not dying as they had said it was. Now, slavery influenced all aspects of life in the South despite the fact that 75% of the southern white families did not own slaves. Because planters had the best land, most small white farmers lived outside the plantation belt in areas that were really unsuitable for cotton. They worked the land with the labor of their family, not slaves or wage workers. Many were self-sufficient and remote from markets, and we call them yeoman farmers because they own their own land. They were often desperately poor and more often illiterate, especially more so than the northern farmers since the southern states, they didn't have any free public schools. Well, part of the reason was because tax base. The uh, poor white farmer <laughs> did not provide a market for manufactured goods. He wouldn't buy anything. He wouldn't sell anything. And the South did not develop any industry. In the South, if you wanted to learn, you would have a private tutor. And if you wanted to go beyond that, you'd have to go north to one of the colleges. And that was usually uh, something that was reserved just for the white plantation families or the upper class. Some of the white farmers, the poor white farmers, resented the plant planters' economic and political power, but most just accommodated the planter because they shared with him a common racial identity and they did buy business from the same stores and, and they had common political culture and I don't know what it is down here but in Kentucky they say they have the expression kissing cousins it seemed like everybody's related to somebody. And so you had these kinship ties in the South. Many small white farmers believed their economic and personal freedom rested on the large white planters slavery. Now most slave owners did not own large plantations. In 1850 most slave holding families owned five or fewer slaves and this was usually a family, a husband and wife and maybe a child. Only a very small number of families own more than 20, and even fewer own more than 100. The planter's slave property provided him with wealth and status and influence, and the planter held the best land. They had the highest income, and they totally dominated local and state politics and government. Of course, the small slave owners, you know, they aspired to become large planters. I mean, that's the American way. You can always move up. Planters own slaves to make huge profits. And they used these profits to be very conspicuous consumption consumers of luxury goods, kind of creating an aristocratic, aristocratic material life. It was well, it, the ones in the north didn't do that; just in the south, they were kind of emulating the uh, nobility of England. Size of slave holding, as you can see, uh, there's very few. Is more white and light green, 10 to 15 or 5 to 10. It, it just, the idea of everybody having a terror like in Gone with the Wind and everybody owning 100 slaves just didn't happen. Plantations were part of the world market. And the planters worked to accumulate land and slaves and make great profits. And sometimes they invested in railroads and banks. But the large white planters, they celebrated not competitive capitalism, but a hierarchical agrarian society in which slaveholding gentlemen took personal responsibility for the well-being of their dependent women, children, and slaves. This outlook is called fraternalism. And it's long been a feature of American slavery. But it deepened with the end of the American African slave trade and kind of closed the cultural gap between slaves and slave owners. And most southern slave owners lived on their own plantation close to their slaves. And this 
policy of paternalism kind of obscured and justified the slavery's brutality. Owners thought themselves kind and responsible, even when they bought, sold, and punished their slaves. Well, over time, Southern values kind of diverged from the North's culture of egalitarianism. Competition, individualism, this was all in the North. In the South, no. Men of all classes followed a code of personal honor. You see, they were expected to defend the reputations of not only themselves and their families, but they must do it with violence if necessary. And doing, while illegal, was not uncommon in the South. Now, you or I wouldn't do it because we're not the upper class. We'd go out behind the barn and duke it out or bite somebody's ear off. But if you were upper class, you'd have a duel. And Southern white women were even more confined to the home and the domestic ideal than their northern sisters. I mean, pro-slavery argument. In the 30 years before the Civil War, pro-slavery thought began to dominate the Southern intellectual and cultural life. Fewer Southern whites felt, as had many of the founding fathers, that slavery was a necessary evil. And more started to argue that it was a positive good. And of course, there's that old standby racism, the belief that blacks were innately inferior to whites and that suited only for slavery. That kind of flamed the pro-slavery arguments. The positive good was we saved them from Africa, we gave them Christianity, we take care of them from birth to death. And of course, they're not suited for freedom, so the white man would take it. If they were so free, the white man would take advantage of them. And there's slavery in the Bible. And it provides economic autonomy that North workers did not have. And they always were using the uh, factories in the North where they would lock the doors and give them no, they can work, you know, from daylight to dark and sometimes even to dark with no, it, working in the factory was bad. And if you happened to hurt yourself at work, you were just SOL because there was no workman's comp, there was no insurance. Uh, if you get blood on the machine, they'll probably make you pay to clean it up and then you'd be fired because you've lost a finger or an arm or something and you can't work there anymore. Of course, the ancient civilizations, the Greek and the Roman, had slaves. A lot of your white Southerners claimed that they were the true inheritors of the revolution's legacy. But, you know, they knew about the Haitian Revolution, and they hated it because some of them came up to the United States and started spreading rumors about the blacks overpowering the whites, but then in Haiti, the blacks outnumbered the whites 500 to 1. And there were slave rebellions in other places, and we knew about the British abolition. But emancipation throughout the Americas strongly shaped debates about slavery and questions like, what's its future? And while the American slave owners argued that emancipation had been a failure, abolitionists, of course, disagreed. And by 1850, the slave system remained in the Western Hemisphere only in Cuba and Puerto Rico, Brazil, and the United States. The white Southerners are complaining that the government interference with their economy threatens to enslave them. And Southern state constitutions acknowledge equality and rights for the white man. But in the 1830s, some pro-slavery writers begin to argue that liberty, equality, and democracy were not necessary beneficial to the uh, South. And South Carolina in particular was home to many who argued that freedom and equality were not universal entitlements, even for the whites. When sectionalism intensified after 1830, more Southern writers and politicians began to defend slavery, not as ensuring equality between the whites, but as the basis of an organic hierarchical society in which large white plantation owners ruled over not only lesser whites, but the slaves. George Fitzhugh from Virginia. He's quite the guy, and when we teach black history, uh, we go quite a bit into this man's history. He took the argument to the extreme. He repudiated Jefferson's ideals and the idea of American, the mission of America is to spread freedoms. He argued that slavery, not liberty, was a normal basis of civilization in world history. He also argued that slaves were happy and contented. And he suggested that the white workers in the North and South would have, they should have paternal white owners too, to take care of them. 
and that way they wouldn't be enslaved by the capitalistic markets and employers of the North. This is a public wicking, public clipping of a slave in Lexington. Uh, putting a leather on has always been a good sure way to do it. For slaves, slavery meant, of course, constant toil and work, harsh punishment, and the constant fear that their families would be destroyed by sale. The slaves were the legal property of the owner. And the few rights that the slave had were never in force. Slaves could be bought and sold by their owners at will, and, and of course they had no voice in the governments that ruled over them. They could not testify in court against whites. They could not sign contracts or buy property. They couldn't own firearms. They couldn't hold meetings apart from a white man. And they certainly couldn't leave a plantation without permission. And by the 1830s, it was deemed illegal to teach slaves how to read and write. The sad thing is, is an awful lot of the black slaves did learn how to read and write because they had something called a whipping boy. And the son of the plantation owner would be having a uh, little African boy go with him to school or around. And he was called a whipping boy because if the white boy did something wrong, the black boy got the whipping. And whereas the white boy would rather be out riding his horse or doing whatever he wanted to, the little black boy would sit there in school and listen and learn. And so before you know it, we've got a more educated black man than we have the white man. And then we'd go back to the plantation and back to his home and teach his mother how to read. Not not a lot, but I mean, enough that they could read the Bible and knew what was going on. Of course, the rules were not always enforced, but the entire system was designed to give the masters control over their slaves. During the early 19th century, uh, some southern states passed laws to prevent slave mistreatment. And in some cases, uh, conditions improved a little. But many slaves supplemented their food by providing and growing their own crops, or, and maybe they'd go out and have a little cow or something, if they were lucky. Uh, they could fish, they could gather, they could hunt. In reality, they actually had better diets than the slaves in the West Indies and Brazil. And paternalism contributed to the slaves' material improvements over time. Because the increasing price of slaves well, now all of a sudden they decided they might better take better care of that slave. They just paid a lot of money for him. So this was the best protection the slave could have was his price. Yet at the same time, slavery was tightened, and the states passed laws making it even harder for the owners to free their slaves, and it made it almost impossible for them to buy their own freedom. I guess you'd say slavery kind of helped define the status of free blacks. By the Civil War, I'm sure you'd be surprised that there's more than half a million free blacks living in the U.S. and the majority in the South. While whites defined their freedom by their distance from slavery, the free blacks were not radically different than enslaved blacks. Because in most of the North, the free blacks, they couldn't vote. They had very few economic opportunities. In the South, free blacks could own their own property and could marry. But they could not be sold as slaves. But they had no other rights in Southern society, and they could not own dogs or guns or liquor. They could not strike a white man, even in self-defense. And they had to carry proof of the fact that they were free with them at all times. You know, in um, other American slave societies, uh, where racial identity was less sharply distinguished, some free blacks amassed property and prestige. But here in this country, the, the sharp racial distinction between black and white left very little room for a mulatto class to emerge. Well, by 1860, very few of the South's free blacks lived in the Lower South, and those who did were mostly in the cities of New Orleans and Charleston, and those two cities had a large, large free black population. And there were a few black communities, and while there were a lot of craftsmen around, some of them even became quite wealthy. They established their own churches and schools, and, and in the Upper South, where a lot of Southern free blacks lived, they worked mostly for wages or as farm labor. And some free blacks even owned slaves. Here again, in black history, we, read, we have to read a book about a free black man. He started out as a slave. His parents were slaves, and they managed, they were very good craftsmen, and they, they managed to work enough to save enough money and buy their own freedom and then they started saving money up to buy their son's freedom and they no sooner bought his freedom then he went to work and started buying his own slaves <laughs>
very interesting concept. A chart is showing uh, the regions where the slaves were, the free black population. Uh, Texas didn't have too many. But look at South Carolina, almost 10,000 free blacks by 1860. Louisiana had 18,000. New Orleans was the place to go. That was the place to go. Delaware in uh, the lower south at 36. But look, it, it's just ridiculous. And of course, the percentage is over to the other side. Distribution of free blacks. Now look where they're all congregated. South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, a few in Kentucky, and right around the Ohio River there between Ohio and Kentucky. Uh, this area right in here, of course, this is where a lot of your abolitionists were. Slavery was, above all, a labor system, in which work occupied the entirety of the slave's time, except for a brief time when he could eat. And on large plantations, slaves performed all kinds of work, from labor in the field to the skilled laborers like carpentry or engineering or shoemaking. Slaves also sometimes worked on steamboats and in mines or in seaports and on railroads. The local authorities used them to build roads and other facilities, and the federal government even used them to help build forts and public buildings. And of course the professionals, like the lawyers and the merchants and the businessmen, they used slaves. And by the start of the Civil War in 1860, 200,000 slaves worked in industries such as ironworks and tobacco factories. And in southern cities, slaves were used as unskilled labor. And sometimes you'd have one who was really, really talented. He would be a skilled artisan. And some slaves were even entrusted with a lot of responsibility. I mean, they could supervise other slaves. They could sell goods that were made on the plantation, or they could even handle money. Now, most slaves, perhaps as much as 75% of the women and 90% of men, worked in the fields. The organizations of their work varied according to the crop, of course, and, and the size of the plantation. On the small farms, the slaves worked right alongside their owner. And that's one of the reasons in the Upper South you didn't have so many slaves run away. Uh, if you've got a good owner and you're not beaten and you're fed and you're taken care of and you don't know where to go, you don't know the land, uh, and you're going to stand out no matter where you go, so, you know, better the devil you know than when you don't. And when they did close to that Ohio River, just across the rivers, the free states, sometimes the plantation owners treated their slaves a little bit better. Ninety percent of men worked in the fields. And, of course, the organization of work varied, like I said, according to the crop and the size of the holdings. The largest concentration of slaves worked on plantations in the cotton belt, and they worked in gangs. They would be directed by an overseer or maybe a slave driver. And the overseer's task was to produce large crops, and it, sometimes he was brutal. And here's an old saying from the military, you know, you know what runs downhill. So if the plantation owner jumped the overseer for not getting the work done, the overseer is going to go out there and jump his workers. Now, slaves who worked in sugarcane in southern Louisiana worked in gangs, and it was the hardest working conditions in the South. But the slaves who worked on the rice plantations in Carolina and Georgia, they had what they called task labor. They were given a job to do, and once they completed it, they had free time for the rest of the day, and they had no supervision because... The plantation owner's not going to go down there where all those snakes are and mosquitoes and malaria. We even sometimes build up little towns around them. But it was also, the death rate was pretty high. And here again, I was showing you the major crops in the south. You've got hemp in Kentucky and some in Missouri. And one time it was a big cash crop. But look at all the green states, the rice, I mean the, the uh, cotton. And a little bit of blue along the coast in Carolina for the uh, sh uh, rice. And you get a little bit of sugar cane in Louisiana. And look at all the tobacco. North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, and even some in Missouri. From the slaves' protective, protect, protective, perspective, slavery in the different regions of the South, some could be worse and some could be better. Slaves in the rice fields faced very harsh conditions, but they had more independence than the other slaves because of the task system.
and skilled urban slave craftsmen had great autonomy and often could hire them some doubt and sometimes could, they would even be allowed to keep their money. Many of your urban slaves even lived by themselves. But by the 1850s, most slave owners began to, oh, shall we say, take the slave out of the city back to the farm. They're beginning to fear the independence of the black man. And according to them, it was eroding the relationship between master and slave. Mm -hmm. Now, slavery is based on force. And slave owners use a variety of methods to maintain order and discipline. And shall we say to persuade the slaves to work productively. Masters could inflict almost any kind of punishment. And it was a rare slave who was never whipped at some point in his or her life even minor infractions. Of course, owners used subtler methods too. They sometimes exploited divisions among the slaves, especially between the field hands and the house servants, because being a house servant was the cream of the crop servitude. You got to eat the same food the master did. You had better clothes and you were treated much better. And sometimes they created incentives for hard work, such as time off or even cash payments. But of course, there was always the most powerful weapon they had that they could threaten to sell you. Now, the slave never gave up hope for freedom and never gave up their will to resist. They didn't like the total control the white man had over them. And they even managed to succeed in creating a semi-independent culture centered on the family and the church. And of course, this enabled them to survive the experiences of bondage and without abandoning entirely their self-esteem and to pass on to other generations the values that, well, it conflicted with what the master had, but it helped them feel more like human beings. And the slave culture grew on the heritage they had from Africa and telling the stories, the uh, oral tradition. And the African influence appeared in the dance and the music forms, which appeared in the worship of the uh, religion and also in slave medicine. But the end of the foreign slave trade kind of helped foster a particularly different and a new African American culture. It's going to be shaped by a combination of American and African traditions and uh, values. But now the family was the center of the slave community, much as it had been in Africa. And because of a natural increase of the slave, well, there seemed to all of a sudden be an equal ratio of male and female. And when you've got the equal ratio, you can have the family. Now, slave marriages were never legally recognized. The master had to consent to them, and the marriages were often the most significant events on the plantation, the way they get married, they jump over a broom or say something, and they usually stay married for life. If not disrupted by a sale by the master, of course, and, and the families typically had two parents. Of course, the sale of the male head of the family would end up having a female headed family. So the threat of being sold and disrupting your family was the slave owner's, as I said, greatest weapon. And the fear of being sold, would, it was with you all the time. Many, many, many men and children were separated from their families by sale, but so were women sometimes. And sometimes the master just simply ignored slave families when he made his decision to sell his slaves. And as, in some ways, gender roles for slaves was different than those in the larger society. Slave men and women were equally powerless. In this cult of domesticity, regard, where you regulate the woman into the home and the kitchen, it didn't apply to the slave woman. Slave men could not provide for their families. They could not protect their wives from physical or sexual abuse by the owners. Or they could not choose how many children they have and how they work. Slave men worked outdoors. While slave women cared for the children and cooked if they were able to have some of their own time. So when they weren't working for the master, they could almost have a, a semblance of a family life. So the slave family is going to remain central to the slave culture. And it's going to allow them, the parents to, you know, to transmit their values and their traditions and how to survive. And of course, one of the first things they teach their children is how to survive is how to stay out of the way of the white man's lash. But a distinctive form of Christianity He helped the slave to survive and resist some bondage. Now, slaves had participated in the religious of the Second Great Awakening, which we didn't get into, but 
every plantation seemed to have a slave preacher. They usually didn't have much education, but they were very good at speaking and they had knowledge of the Bible. Now, urban slaves often established their own churches, but masters used Christianity as another means of control and discipline. Some required their slaves to attend sermons, reminding slaves that theft was immortal and that servants should obey their masters. But slaves began to transform Christianity and turn it around to their own purpose. They started blending the African tradition and the Christian beliefs. Now, slave religion was practiced usually at night in secret or out in the open away from the master during the day. These meetings were frequently interactive and very emotional. And they loved the Bible story of the Exodus in which God chooses Moses to lead the enslaved Jews out of Egypt to the promised land of freedom. That was very central to the black Christianity. And slaves sometimes saw themselves as the chosen people with whom one day would be delivered from bondage. With Christ as a redeemer, he cared for the oppressed, and this was important for them. Of course, some of the other heroes from the Bible included Jonah, who escaped from the whale, and David, who kind of beat the heck out of Goliath. And Daniel, who escaped from the lion's den. But the Christian message of brotherhood and equality of all before the Creator, it seemed to kind of repudiate the idea of slavery. The slave culture rested on the slaves' belief that slavery was unjust and their yearnings for freedom. Despite pro-slavery arguments, slaves believed that they were merely being deprived of the fruits of their labor by their idle planters, masters, living a luxurious life. And while most slaves knew it was impossible to directly combat, combat this situation, it did not prevent them from desiring freedom. Slaves continually talked and dreamed of liberty, and their actions during and after the Civil War kind of came from their experience of slavery and their hope of escaping slavery. It's supposed to be a painting of New Orleans. Uh, New Orleans was a fantastic city. As I said, it started out as a Spanish city. It became a French city, then it became an American city, then it became a Mecca for everybody in the Caribbean. Uh, it's a huge, huge, huge port. And she has the reputation of, well, that's why we got some, well, until Katrina, we had so many old buildings there because she wouldn't fight. She always surrendered. When any enemy came up the river, you know, don't blow us out of the water. <laughs> Savannah did the same thing. Out in the whites, invading federal, state, and local authorities dedicated to preserving slavery, slaves only rarely rebelled. Compared to the Caribbean or Latin American slavery, where the slaves there were much more numerous, they kind of outnumbered 500 to 1. And sometimes they even had slaves there that were imported directly from Africa. They were kind of frequent there and bloody. But the slave rebellions in the U.S. were smaller and much less frequent. Of course, this doesn't mean that slaves simply kind of submitted to their condition. Resistance to slavery took many forms from individual acts of disobedience to the occasional uprising. And of course, most of the resistance was in a passive form. And I have some things listed here. They're spitting in the master's food. Now, he doesn't know you spit in his food, but you know he's eating your spit. Or working really slow, master. Or breaking a tool and having to go back to the plantation to get another tool. And you kill the whole day by going back and forth. You do such poor work, he doesn't let you do it again. You could accidentally abuse an animal. Or, of course, you can always fake an illness. But if you do that, you're taking a chance that the master's wife might come out and put some medicine in your mouth. And blackstrap molasses and all those kind of things they like to pour down you. Yeah. Some people stole food, and but they rarely assaulted a white man. Or they, they, If the cook put something in the food that's going to make the master sick, she's going to be punished. And if the master should die after eating, then she would be executed. She wouldn't even be a trial. Armed attacks were very, very rare. Some would run away for a day or two just to frustrate their master and hide out. And a very small number attempted to permanently escape. But a slave had no knowledge of the geography around him. And here again, I, I told you about that book we were reading in Black History, about the black man who owned slaves. He had a slave that ran away, spent almost a week less than a mile away from the plantation because he didn't know. He knew the plantation. But once he got off the plantation, he, did, he knew there was a town somewhere, but he didn't know where to find it. <laughs> 
Now they have estimated roughly a thousand made it to Canada each year. And most of the slaves that escaped were from the upper south. Uh, it's kind of hard to go from Atlanta, Georgia, all the way north. Most of them were in the Kentucky, Virginia area. Uh, sometimes some from Tennessee would come up. But in the deep south, the runaways would have a tendency to go to the large city like New Orleans or Charleston and kind of blend in with the free blacks. Now I've got here a story of Josiah Hansen. Josiah Hansen, of course it's not mentioned in your text, it's just an interesting story I think. And I love to tell stories. Josiah Hansen was a tall, well-built, good-looking, smart black man. He had never been branded, he had never been whipped, he knew how to play the game. He belonged to a man in uh, Maryland who had a brother, I'm sorry folks, who lived in Kentucky. And the man in Maryland was, oh, he was a gambler. And whenever he would lose, he would put his most valuable property, his slaves, up for collateral. And he always wanted to manage to get them back. But one day he'd had a very bad run at the poker tables and he put his slaves up for auction and he couldn't get them back. So the sheriff comes out and says, Mr. Riley, uh, we're going to be out tomorrow to, to confiscate your slaves. So he tells his overseer, happened to be Josiah Henson, to take his wife and children and 20 other slaves and go to his brother in Kentucky. So Mr. Henson does. Now he doesn't know how to read or write, but he's also one of those preacher fellows. He has a, has a beautiful speaking voice and he manages to make a few coins on the way out there. And he gets out to Kentucky and he turns himself into his master's brother. Well, about a year later, they get a letter from the brothers saying, sell all the slaves except Josiah and have Josiah bring you the money. So his brother did, and Josiah takes the money and goes back to Maryland with the money for the other slave sell. And along the way, he preaches and he comes up with about $300. So when he gets back there, he asks his master, can I buy my slave, my freedom for $300? And he's, like I said, he's a no good son of a gun. He said, sure, Josiah, give me the money and let me give you a piece of paper to give to my brother. So Josiah takes the paper and gives him all the money and he heads back to Kentucky. And when he gets back there, he finds out that the note says uh, his dumb slave didn't know I just took his money. He's not free. Joshua didn't do anything. Things are going along pretty good and Josiah starts getting a little antsy. And Mr. Riley in Kentucky said, maybe we better sell Josiah before he takes the notion to run. Because we get a good money for him. So he assigns his son to take Josiah and get on the boat, go down to Memphis to the slave market and sell Josiah. His son gets on the boat and Josiah goes with him, leaving his wife and children behind. And the kid gets sick. So Josiah gets off the boat and takes his son with him and goes to shore and he nurses him back to health. And as soon as he gets halfway healthy, he takes him back to his daddy. Well, Josiah's finally got it through his thick head now that Mr. Riley's going to sell him. He need to do something about it. So he walked, waits for his chance and he rounds up some more money and he takes his wife and kids and he crosses the Ohio River into Ohio. And then he managed to work his way all the way up into Canada. Now when he gets up there, he uh, gets in touch with a bunch of Quakers who got a place for runaway slaves because Canada doesn't have any extradition. And they start a trade school for the runaway slaves who don't know how to do anything except pick cotton. And he made a couple of trips back to the States and speaking about against slavery. And then he decided to write his biography. Well, he wrote his, and the biography, the name of the biography is The Life and Times of a Slave Named Josiah Henson Who Lived Out of Die. I mean, it's really, really long. And a young lady who lives in the Northeast read it. Now, here's where the story gets kinky. This lady decided she wants to talk to him. So they meet and she interviews him about how things have been going in Kentucky. And like I said, Josiah had never been whipped. He'd never been hurt in any way, although he had witnessed whippings. He had seen the cruelties that happened, so he told her about them. And she wrote about them. And that lady's name is Harriet Beecher Stowe. And she wrote the book Uncle Tom's Cabin, which she based on information she got from Josiah Hansen. And for years, we all thought that 
Mary Ayer Dietrich Stowe would come down across the Ohio into Lexington and visit her plantation, but she didn't. And just a couple of miles from where I live, there's a thing called the Josiah Henson Trail, where he supposedly, and I say supposedly because, you know, you don't know. We didn't have roads there then, so he could very well have made that particular trek to the Ohio River. But that's why I want to tell you about Josiah Henson. Uh, number one, why didn't he run? Uh, why? His wife and children were still in Kentucky. Although he was a very, very attractive man. As a matter of fact, one of the English history books tells a story that after the Civil War, because he helped recruit during the Civil War, too. And after the Civil War, he's an older man. He's in his late 80s now. And he goes to England. And he's presented to the Queen, Queen Victoria. Now, she's a little bit short, fat lady. And, of course, she is so much in love with her dead husband that, you know, she's still wearing black. She's still mourning after 30 years. And I can just see, you know, in Josiah Henson having been a slave, he's not going to bow down to any white person, especially a white woman. So he just kind of bows just a little bit from the waist, you know, Your Majesty. And here she says, Oh, I've heard about you, Mr. Henson. I, I hear that you're quite the young man, that you're very attractive, and you're very vocal. And Josiah Henson looks at well, so they say. I've heard that before, Your Majesty. Just a cute little side note. So you jump ahead from 1890 to 1967, and there is was at that time a historical society in the area that I live. And one of the ladies that was in the historical society went up to Canada, on a vacation, and she came across the Josiah Henson Museum. And the lady in there was telling her all about Josiah Henson, was really from where she was, from Owensboro, Kentucky. And she thought, yeah, you just want me to buy something. Yeah, 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 yeah. <coughs> so she comes back home and tells the story. They got to doing some research, and they found out that by cracky, Josiah Henson had been in Owensboro, Kentucky for almost four years. And it was Josiah Henson that Harriet Beecher Stowe had based her story on. And they discovered that the granddaughter of Mr. Riley, who had owned him while he was here, was still living out the edge of town. So they go out to interview her, and of course, he was gone before she was born. But she's a little bit short lady with big blue eyes and lots of white curly hair. And she's, oh yes, she remembers him talking about that slave. So, you know, the story is he ran away, but that's not what happened. He was chased off. You see, he had an eye for the girls. <laughs> and the other slaves told him if he didn't leave their women alone and get out, that he was going to be emasculated. <laughs> and whether it happens or not, I don't know. It's just a footnote in history. Of course, there was the Underground Railroad that helped. Uh, black and white, male and female. Uh, and they operated almost like a secret organization. Uh, no one knew too much in case they got caught because I don't know what they did in Carolina, but I know in Kentucky it didn't matter if you were a woman or not. If you were caught helping a black person escape, you would go to jail and forfeit all your property. I guess you call them a sympathetic black and white abolitionists. You only knew where the next station was up, if it, like I say. Of course, the most famous one is Harriet Tubman, which we didn't get into. Now, in a few cases, there was a large rebellion. And, of course, the most famous case involves the slaves aboard the Amistad, which was a slave ship. It was loaded with slaves in, in 1839, and the slaves rebelled on the ship and forced... They tried to force... They killed most of the white people, but they, they uh, kept the navigator from the... They were supposed to be sailing back to Africa, which he did sail to the east during the day, but at night he would sail to the north. And, of course, they ran into the uh, North America. Well, as soon as it got to the North American coast, the Coast Guard seized it, and the slaves were jailed, and there's a battle between abolitionists and the Spanish owners of the slave. They want them returned. Well, now, President uh, Martin Van Buren wanted to return his I apologize. Patches! 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 President Van Buren wants to return the slaves to Cuba. And he's also getting ready to run for re-election. And he didn't want to lose a southern vote. 
but the abolitionists and helped the slaves to their freedom and even the Supreme Court it went that far John Quincy Adams the former president defended them and he argued that since the slaves had been brought from Africa in violation of international treaties banning the slave trade that they should be freed and the Supreme Court agreed and to make a long story short most of the freed slaves immigrated back to Africa and of course there's a great movie called the Amistad uh, it really has no legal bearing on slavery, but it demonstrates the desire for freedom and may have even inspired later revolts on other slave ships. But slaves really only rarely mounted organization, that, I mean, organized rebellions here. There was a, the four largest conspiracies in our history happened between 1800 and 1831. There was Gabriel's Rebellion in 1800, which we talked about. It was followed in 1811 by an uprising on a sugar plantation in New Orleans in which several hundred armed slaves armed with machetes and things tried to march on New Orleans, but they were defeated in a very bloody encounter with the militia and federal troops. Eleven years later, in 1822, Denmark Bassey, a slave carpenter in Charleston, well, he'd actually bought his freedom. He was no longer a slave. Had a very well-organized rebellion. Uh, his idea was that he was going to get everybody together and work and on a Sunday when all the good people in Charleston were in church he was going to close and lock the doors and you know put boards on them and keep them from getting out and burn the church down but unfortunately uh, one of the people who was supposed to be helping him was a house slave and he got to thinking what happens if this doesn't work so he was betrayed by one of his followers and then he and 34 others were arrested and executed. But of course the most well-known and bloody is Nat Turner's rebellion in 1831. Now Nat Turner was a slave creature, a kind of a mystic. He'd run away one time and came back. And he was thoroughly convinced that God had appointed him to lead a black rebellion. He was well planned and armed and although he had a specific date because he had had this vision, it rained and they had to put it off for a month. And lo and behold one of his followers betrayed the plan. But not before Nat Turner and his small band of less than 100 men had taken machetes to women and children and men sleeping in their beds. I think something like 60 were killed. But of course then the Virginia militia shows up and captures him and executes him. Well, of course after a trial. Really, because he wants a trial. But the Turner's Rebellion, it kind of sent shockwaves all through the South because every slave owner just knew that they had a Nat Turner on their plantation. And what is the result? Well, the legislature in Virginia passed even harsher laws restricting the slaves even more, and even some rights of the blacks were taken, free blacks were taken away. And it wasn't very long before the other southern states followed suit. This rebellion, as strange as it may seem, caused a reaction with the abolitionists in the north. And they began to demand even louder and longer the immediate abolition of slavery and it kind of intensified sexual hostility because the South is going to use this as an excuse a little bit later on. Uh, the North is really getting nasty, telling the South that, you know, you're living bad, you're, you're, everything you're doing is illegal and immoral, and you can only take so much, and you're either going to change or you're going to defend your, your stance, and that's what the South chose to do, was defend their stance for slavery. Wrongly, but they did. Okay, here, this kind of takes care of it. I'm going to have the... Uh, PowerPoint, of course, will be up with the lecture, and I'm going to put the outline of the chapter also up. You don't have a quiz. You don't have a test. Um, thank you for listening.